thanks for tuning in. Uh, whether you're here in Barcelona in person or watching us on a live stream, we're very excited to have a full house of folks interested in staking and policy. Uh, so my name is Wee Ming Chun. I'm the uh, Deputy General Counsel at Ava Labs. Um, and uh, you know, the topic we're talking about on this panel is understanding the glory of staking. Um, so a bit of an unusual, pan unusual topic, uh, at least unusual phrasing of the topic. Uh, but you know, we're going to talk a bit about what it is, uh, what's glorious about it, and uh, how we should be thinking about it from a policy and a regulatory perspective. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of confusion around the term staking, and our hope is we can demystify some of that um, and show you why it's so special. Uh, and uh, for that purpose, we've got a great panel uh, set up here. Uh, I'll just quickly run through their names, and we'll have them introduce themselves. Uh, so just starting my left, we've got Eva Lawrence uh, at Figment, uh, Robert Ellison at All Nodes, uh, Karen Ubel at Goodwin, and Angela Angelovska Wilson at DLX Law. So Eva, maybe you can kick us off with the intro. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Eva Lawrence. I am the head of EMEA for Figment. Uh, we are an institutional staking firm, so we help uh, VCs, hedge funds, foundations, everything in between to uh, stake their proof of stake tokens. Um, I come from a traditional finance background. I was a, uh, a trader at Morgan Stanley uh, for eight and a half years. Uh, it was in both uh, fixed income and, and equities. And I've been in crypto now for five years, which seems like a lifetime. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Robert Ellison. I work for Allnodes. Allnodes, like Figment, is a infrastructure provider for proof of stake. We have a lot of retail clients and institutional clients, so we have the whole spectrum. Uh, we run about 35,000 nodes across quite a few uh, countries at this point. Um, my background is in uh, protocol development and software and encryption, but that was a long time ago. Uh, so I do business development now and growth. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Karen Ubell. I'm a partner in Goodman Proctor's San Francisco office and uh, one of the co-chairs of our blockchain and digital currency practice. Um, my background is in securities laws. I used to work at the SEC, no, no booing yet. It was, it was a long time ago. Um, but what I, I really do is, is working, with, um, working with projects that are launching new tokens, new, new protocols, new platforms, uh, helping them design and um, kind of implement around the guidance as it comes out and uh, thinking about some of the you know, staking products that, uh, you know, design, designing a lot of the staking products um, and the features of a, of a staking um, uh, protocol uh, to help be as compliant as possible. And I'm Angela Angelovska Wilson. I am a co founder of DLX Law. We are a boutique crypto focused uh, law firm. Um, I am also one of the founding board members of POSA, which is the Proof of Stake Association, and so I have been in the staking space for a long time. Um, long time ago, uh, <laughs> when we started POSA, um, out of the top 20 blockchains, um, only one was Proof of Stake, and now we have the reverse. Out of the top 20, only one is Proof of Work. So it's um, been wonderful to see kind of the development of the staking industry, and um, both on the protocol level uh, adoption as well as on the services. Great. So uh, you know, hopefully you guys are as excited as I am to talk to them. So jumping off on the point that Angela made, uh, blockchains, uh, quite a number of them are proof of stake now. And uh, just to set the stage, that is the focus of our panel. When we say staking, we are focused on protocol staking for proof of stake networks. Uh, you know, that term has been abused to mean a whole bunch of different things. Uh, you know, earning yield at an exchange, uh, you know, yield farming using some protocols. Uh, and our hope is that, you know, uh, you walk away from here understanding that when we say staking, we mean a technical service to provide for the safety and security of a network. So, you know, uh, just on that point, uh, maybe I'll turn to Eva first for the first question. What is staking? So I think 
as you rightly pointed out, staking has been used as a term to kind of lump in everything together. Um, people like to, when they don't really understand a concept, just, you know, put, put, put it to the nearest thing that they can think of. So unfortunately for, for staking, things like DeFi, things, things like yield farm, farming, lending, have all got lumped in with staking because people are trying to relate it to something they know. Um, and what we're talking about today when we talk about staking is non-custodial protocol staking. So um, where tokens are delegated by the, the asset owner to support the network, uh, be involved in governance and earn a return from the protocol. Um, and that, that last part is particularly important. The, the returns aren't determined by, by, by Figment, by all nodes. They are determined by the, the protocol. Um, so Avalanche decides how much the return is, is paid out. Uh, and also, there is no transfer of title. So um, when these tokens are staked, they're not transferred from one owner to the other. Generally, they are just staked um, and delegated, but not uh, transferred. Yeah, and so non-custodial staking um, at a protocol level, right? So rewards that are automatically generated by the protocol according to the rules of the protocol, uh, which is very different from a centralized actor or entity deciding what the rewards should be. Um, so, you know, uh, Robert, um, what are the different ways in which one could stake? Well, if, yeah, I mean, when it comes to protocol staking, I think it's important to understand there's a really easy way to tell the difference between that and like DeFi staking because it ends up being a bit of a marketing problem where people use the term staking. And so how you could verify if it's real protocol staking, meaning the rewards come from Avalanche directly to your wallet, is going to a block explorer. You could, you could see your address on chain and thus you could, you could tell that that's actually staking. When it comes to how to stake, there's sort of like maybe two decisions that help with that process. Uh, the first one being, do you want to custody your, your keys or do you want someone else to custody for them? Those are both, you know, fine decisions. If, if you don't, you know, trust yourself, for example, and it has a lot of money, it's perfectly okay to use a, a qualified custodian to custody your keys and then you could stake through that custodian. Uh, but a lot of people want to custody their own keys. So that's a good way to decide how you want to enter the staking. The other decision you make is once you've sort of decided on that, what type of staking do you want to do? You want to stake to a validator that already exists, for example, a Figment or an All Nodes, meaning you just go with your wallet, you know, you, you sign the contract, you delegate your tokens, and you start staking, and the rewards come back directly to you from the network. The alternative choice there is you could actually run your own nodes, meaning you're actually running a hardware, uh, you know, an actual computer that is a validator. Um, and so you could do both of those things, but that comes with more responsibility. Uh, and it also comes with more rewards typically as well. Yeah, so a few different flavors of how to actually stake. Um, and uh, you know, obviously different arrangements come with different requirements, um, you know, different risks and rewards. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say risks, risks too. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's a lot riskier to, to run it yourself. Um, you have to be responsible for um, being aware of any slashing risk, um, and that's often why firms uh, and individuals come to, to, com to companies like Figment because of the, the risks of, of running it themselves. Um, and and as, um, um, as we were just saying, you know, focusing on custodians as well, because often that choice of who to custody your assets or if to you if you want to use an outside custody firm is, is a big decision um, so we see often staking being discussed at that point um, as well and we're also seeing a lot of, of wallet providers offer staking or starting to offer stake, staking so not the custodian but the custody tech like a like a fraction or similar they are offering um, staking or looking at ways to offer staking, because that means that you as the underlying individual can still retain control of your AVAX tokens, 
you can, um, you know, you can use their tech and then you can stake via a, a firm like Figment. So I think that it definitely comes up when you talk about the, the, the concept of, of custody and people are thinking, okay, now I've figured out how I'm going to hold these tokens, now how do I maximize their return? Yeah, um, and, uh, you know, there's uh, different protocols have different ways by which they provide staking rewards, by which they um, require staking to validate the network. Um, you know, some have slashing and some do not. So I think most of us in the room uh, recall that the Avalanche protocol does not actually have slashing. And so it's a different spin on how staking works. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's so special about it. What's, what's important about staking? Why do protocols need it? Um, so uh, Karen, maybe you can start and others can feel free to jump. Yeah. Um you know, I think it's really interesting, as Angela mentioned, to see what has been a, a huge growth and proliferation of proof of stake based protocols. Um, I think, in large part, what I see as one of the big, uh, you know, kind of the glories of it, shall we say, is um, the ability to have a lot more, a, a lot broader and more decentralized uh, validator base, right? Without necessarily having to have the expensive, um, notwithstanding that you know you do have to have validator equipment, um, but using the delegation tools of most proof of stake protocols, and also just having a, a lot lower cost of entry, you know, you're able to have a much more decentralized validator base, which I think is you know really the key and the core of what we're trying to build with a blockchain-based protocol. Um, I think it addresses a lot of the climate um, uh, criticisms. Um, that we've heard from from regulators. I think that was really kind of low-hanging fruit um, For a lot of regulators and a lot of naysayers um, But even even so it's great to be able to um, address those uh, criticisms um, and implement something that um, You know many I think many protocols are, are now carbon negative or carbon neutral um, and are much better uh, you know, Positioned on that front to address that um, You know Angela, what do you? Well, I mean, I think um, I agree with all of the above um, with, uh, with respect to kind of what makes staking special. I think for me, it's also the ability to have kind of the different reiterations and the developments in the technology that then allows the networks and the builders on top of the layer ones to, to provide products and services that are much more in line with, I'll say, the future <laughs> than what we have seen on some of the proof of work um, networks. And the ability to um, also go back to what I would call kind of the core principles of the crypto space where it is about being decentralized, it is about the community, and the ability to incentivize um, responsible parties in the system. I think one of the things we did not say earlier uh, w with respect to staking is what it's not, and it is not the yield um, you know, type of products, the lending products that we have seen come under some of the regulatory scrutiny. So when we talk about kind of the glory of staking, I'm re we on this panel, I think, are talking more of, of from the I'll call it the pure protocol staking point of view and not some of the, if I may say so, bastardized products that have been called staking. Yeah, and I like what you said about going back to the core principles of crypto. Uh, and I venture further actually to say the core principles of the internet, right, which is open access, anyone can use the internet, anyone can build something, launch it on the internet that anyone else can access. Um, and staking clearly is a way for anyone anyone in this room, right, to participate. Uh, you know, there's a learning curve. You need to understand how to do that. And uh, there are companies, right, you guys do help with that. Uh, but the goal is anyone can run a node, uh, process their own transactions, process others' transactions, and cooperatively secure the network. Rob, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of fun to call it glory. So th thanks for calling the panel the glory of staking. Uh, it's a bit of a boring subject, let's be honest, it's protocols, but what I think is super interesting is if you rewind back to pre-crypto, no one really cared about infrastructure. You know, Facebook users, Instagram, whatever, your banking app, the general public generally doesn't give a shit about infrastructure. It, they care if it works. And that sort of presented some problems because it's like, okay, what are they doing with that data? How do you interact with it? 
as we become more attached digitally to everything that we do, um, crypto came along with sort of a solution that's sort of energizing people to actually care about infrastructure, like how do these protocols work? How is my information being used? Do I have a say in how it's being used? And then incentivizing people through rewards, not yield, but rewards, <laughs> um, to actually be engaged. So I think that's like a real paradigm shift where people are actually interested a little more in infrastructure. I think I would just add to, I think, you know, don't hear from us this kind of demonization of rewards and incentives. That is the key and the core of, of what staking is. It, you know, the yield word is, I think, it just was getting in us, in us into a lot of trouble in this space. And, and, and I think, you know, the other, the other piece I would add too, kind of on the decentralization aspect of it, with so many of these, uh, you know, you're, you're asking people to lock up their tokens, right? I mean, it, it's also a signaling effort of, you know, where are, you know, on a crowdsource basis, where are people willing to, you know, invest that? Con well, I say invest, but I say it very carefully. But um, but and it's not invest. It, it really recorded by the way. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm always aware of that. Um, but truly, you know, to lock to lock in their um, their stake, right? I mean, it's a, it's a signaling effort of the people that are doing the work to understand what they're building and what they're building on, and it's a signaling effort of of, of where. Um, you know, what that product is, as, as you're saying, and, and what's working. It's signaling, but it's also participation, right? It, I think it, that's, the, that's the glory of staking, is it? It has both, right? It signals, but also it, it, it allows for part, participation in the network, furthering the network. Um, and I think that kind of the dual edge sword is one of the things that's really particularly special. Yeah, so as a segue, uh, you know, if staking is meant to be open and participatory and anyone can do it, then I think we had to talk about the policy and the regulatory treatment of staking. Um, and so, you know, as the industry has matured, I think policymakers and lawmakers themselves have gotten more savvy about staking. Um, and some of them have uh, taken that to heart, and you can see in the policies and proposals that they put forward, that makes sense. That's how the tech works. This is its purpose. It makes sense to treat it as infrastructure. Uh, but that's not the case across the board, right? Uh, you know, as an example, and I'd love to hear each of the panelists' views on this, um, in the US, uh, there's a proposal called the Digital AML Act, uh, the Warren Marshall Bill. Uh, and one of the hallmarks of this three-page uh, proposal is to treat validators as uh, regulated financial intermediaries, right? So if you were to spin up a validator and start uh, processing transactions on a proof of stake network, uh, you now have obligations under the Bank Secrecy Act to report, you know, who's sending these transactions, uh, do any of them look suspicious, uh, and things that really banks and money transmitters do, right? So there is a bit of this confusion about uh, processing transactions uh, as a base layer technical activity and treating all those transactions as financial activity. So uh, the question for, for you all, uh, maybe we can start with you, Angela, uh, is uh, which policymakers, or how have policymakers gotten things right or wrong about staking? Well, um, we were joking earlier before the panel started that the, the answer to this question is none of the above. Uh, no matter what list of regulators, anywhere in the world you are able to put forward on the list, I think the, the answer will be none of the above. And in fairness, that is also due to some of the you know, novelty and the inability for regulators to really understand in depth the various types of layer ones that are using proof of stake protocols and being able to distinguish kind of who does what how. Um, it is a complicated um, matter. Um, I think for, for me, one of the crucial elements that a lot of the regulators need to understand in order to get it right is what Robert was saying earlier, that staking is about the infrastructure. So with respect to, for example, the Warren Marshall Bill, when I have been talking to policymakers in Washington about it, I um, have put forward the, the proposition that first data, which processes millions of transactions a second, 
for the visa and other um, networks is not considered to be a financial intermediary and is not subject to some of these obligations. What are the functionalities that are making it them have to be treated differently? And I think being able to kind of talk through regulators about understanding the infrastructure layer and the services that are being provided so that they're not, you know, just throwing the baby out <laughs> with the bathwater as they uh, are writing the rules is extremely important. Karen, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I think I, I, I asked you to hold your booze for the SEC until later. Now, now would probably be the time. Uh, but um, unfortunately, I, I think the painting with a broad brush has certainly been the case um, across all, all elements of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Uh, proof of stake uh, being among them from from the SEC and the securities law perspective. Um, you know, the recent settlement with Kraken. Uh, you know, I, I think. Uh, Gensler might have felt that that was a, a broad brush win, but you know, as we very quickly and immediately pointed out, that was a very different uh, type of, of, of staking by a custodial intermediary um, and, and not anywhere near the true protocol level of proof of stake. So um, I think we can all feel pretty comfortable that that settlement is not something that will reach to the, the protocol level uh, proof of stake. But you know, we also saw Gensler question um, Ethereum's uh, switch to proof of stake. Um, again, you know, generally I would say that was still just an effort to paint with a broad brush and cast um, a lot of doubt across the industry, which has been um, an, an ongoing effort um, from the top uh, leadership there. Um, so I, I would say certainly uh, the SEC is also among those who uh, have not gotten it right. Um, but I, I don't think it's a lack of understanding. I think it's just um, you know, they're, they're trying to move quickly right now um, in, in some of the actions they're trying to take. Uh, to across the industry, but I'll let others uh, weigh in. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, everyone's sort of in the same boat right now in crypto. It's not obviously just stakers. It's, it's everyone who's, you know, it, it's uncertain times coming from Gensler specifically in some ways. I, I guess maybe it's more of a broad stroke. There's just a lot of uncertainty regulatory-wise in the market, which is hurting entrepreneurs. It's hurting, you know, people who are established. Um, what's actually going on, right? So I think when, when we look at staking specifically, uh, it's interesting to sort of contrast Kraken versus Coinbase. Uh, Kraken settled. Uh, they were managing pooled staking, and, and there's a reason why they settled. I, I won't get into the weeds on why. But Coinbase isn't settling, and Coinbase is now going to fight the SEC, and they're pretty aggressive and, and standing their ground. Uh, with specifically with staking, so that's going to be really interesting to see. And you know, unfor the unfortunate side of that, it's going to take probably years. Um, so that uncertainty will continue, and, and that lack of clarity that we have to, you know, stay strong and and uh, just keep on fighting for it. Yeah, the, the the length of time is only really good for the law firms, right? <laughs> In terms of the amount of fees. Yeah, these guys but here. Even, the, <laughs> even then, we'd rather do building stuff. <laughs> Yeah. But um, I think I think we, we, when we were talking about it earlier, you know, the one thing that there is at least some positivity here in Europe. It might not be perfect. Mika doesn't cover staking, um, but also, but you know, at least we have a start here. We have some kind of a framework. It's better than no framework. It's better than regulation by enforcement. Um, so I'll take it. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting, really, to see to see how this pans out. Right? How how does it work in practice? Where will they look at at, at um, you know staking and, and DeFi in particular next to to, to broaden the scope, um, or will they you know will they not? I, I think it's yeah we're very much in a, a, a wait and see phase there. But I think at least we've taken some small, albeit baby, steps. Yeah, and to uh, you know, just explain that a little bit to the audience, uh, you know, in the final draft of Mika that was just passed about a month or so ago, uh, there was one change that was added to the text, which is that uh, staking rewards that are automatically generated by the protocol are not treated as uh, part of the obligations of an issuer, obviously because there is no issuer when the rewards come directly from the protocol. And so this relates to uh, some of uh, Mika's requirements that an issuer has to publish a white paper, uh, you know, act fairly in the best interests of uh, purchasers and things like that. 
There's one more regulator that in the U.S. has gotten it very wrong, <laughs> and um, uh, that is the IRS when it comes to the taxation that is, you know, connect, uh, with respect to staking rewards. And, you know, obviously the danger is that other global taxing authorities may follow suit. Um, I think one of the things that we've been working on on POSA is actually suing on behalf of um, a taxpayer in order to get some clarity and we continue to work on that because the attack vector from the taxation that staking rewards are to be taxed at the time that they are received, not when they are actually sold, it makes it much more difficult for people to participate in the staking networks as we all want to encourage. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, so uh, we've got five minutes left. Uh, you know, uh, maybe now would be a good time to sort of take questions from the audience. Uh, does anyone have any question? about staking and uh, policy around staking? Yeah, over there. Go ahead. That would be helpful if you could, yeah, raise your voice. Sorry, uh, you asked about restaking? Eigenlayer. Uh, I mean, I think it's a little bit early to know um, yet what, what the plan is for Eigenlayer. It seems to me that it's still very much development st stage. It does not get launched, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I think generally around Ethereum in general, um, we are, are pretty bullish following Shanghai and Capella. We're seeing a lot of interest, and I, I think it's exciting to see companies you know, building um, building in the space, whether it's, you know, Eigenlayer, whether it's MEV, MEV Boost, and companies looking at, uh, at that area. Um, so I think that in general, both for staking and general growth of the ecosystem, it's promising, um, but I think it's too early to say. Uh, any other questions? I'll just make a plug that even though we think that the regulators are not getting it right, um, POSA is doing a great job of helping them to, uh, to understand and addressing it from all fronts. So, I think, uh, Thank you for the plug-in. Um, POSA did actually work with the regulators on putting forward kind of uh, industry principles in the very early days. We are in the um, st stage of updating those and obviously um, you know very thankful to the other team and Lee who is uh, also sits on the board um, but if any of you um, have anything that you would like to see more as a staking industry per se in the principles that we are updating we at POSA would be very well would welcome any comments what would be your guys' one piece of advice for Gary Gensler? <laughs> to read the law? Yes, uh, be guided by the law. Well, the one piece of advice I would always say is that disclosure is not the barrier. Um, you know, ev almost every client that I work with, if, if disclosure were the only barrier um, to coming in and registering, uh, they would do it. Uh, but it, it's simply not, and it's disingenuous. Um, to continue to insist that it's an easy process uh, and um, you know we, we need a more uh, a good more good faith on the other side in order to be able to solve these problems um, in a way that helps us to to achieve compliance and help this industry move forward in a meaningful way I would uh, actually ask him to retire <laughs> well that's the easy answer but. Yeah. Different, uh, um, different strokes for different folks I think it's important to say when you look, you know, something even specific like Avalanche, the, the technology is amazing, like, and, and there's no stopping that. So the more people that are involved, the more people that are educated, the more people that are building on it, and, and also staking, right, because you have that component, which is, which is very novel and unique. Uh, you know, the, the, more, the more, I guess, the more people that are involved, the, the governments will soon, soon realize that there's... This is something, you know, and, and then they'll, they'll, they'll actually start listening and, and we'll, we'll sort of crest that wave until the, and, and that uncertainty will, will sort of fall away. Yeah, and so, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to add that I think that part of this, the answer is that there's nothing that we can tell Gary. Uh, he, he, and, I, and I don't know that it's necessarily just him. I think it's also for the administration overall and that the, the real efforts have turned towards Congress. And so uh, to the extent that you all are involved uh, in any way, you know, I think that's where change uh, will come yeah. with its own challenges, of course. But I think that's what we've all kind of refocused our efforts on. Yeah, so I think to, to summarize the message at least I'm hearing is uh, one, understand the technology, and two, beware of misconceptions. Uh, and both of these happen to be part of the Owl Explains Web3 Trio Wisdom. So I encourage everyone to sort of take a look at that as a guiding principle to how to think about policy. So uh, on that note, thanks very much. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the panel. Uh, see you the next time.